welcome to uh, ORF and thank you so much, Alexander Iskandrian, for agreeing to give us this interview on what is a very uh, topical subject. A lot of people uh, want to be educated about it. It is the issue between Armenia and Azerbaijan, the issue of Nagorno-Karabakh. You being the head of an Armenian think tank and a, a very well-known political analyst in Armenia, what is your sense about what happened? Why did it happen? Uh, first, thank you, thank you. Uh, or ORF organizers of this interview, it is, I would say that it is uh, important for, not just for Europe or for United States of America, I had a lot of interview, interviews uh, for this part of the world, but to Asia, to South Asia, to India, uh, public there to listen about what's going in in, in the region here at the border of Europe and Asia in Armenia. Uh, it, the COVID, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is approximately more than 30 years old. Still in Soviet Union, we have clashes in Nagorno-Karabakh in the region, which was uh, populated, was and is populated by ethnically Armenians. By, but by some reasons, it in, in early Soviet times, in 20s, uh, Stalin times, it was uh, included Azerbaijani Soviet Socialist Republic. So you had problem in this autonomy, this was autonomy in, in Soviet times inside of Azerbaijan populated by uh, Armenians and the conflict was even before Soviet Union collapsed. It was one of the factors of uh, collapsing of Soviet Union and you had war, so-called First Karabakh War, now already we had two, unfortunately, and after First Karabakh War in 1994, uh, it finished the First War and Armenians, ethnically Armenians, controlled territory of Nagorno-Karabakh. Nagorno-Karabakh territory was approximately about uh, 12,000 square uh, kilometers. It's a pro approximately uh, might be about seven, eight thousand miles square miles, and you had population of just one hundred fifty thousand ethnic Armenians. But Azerbaijan was preparing to war all this uh, twenty six years. Azerbaijan is bigger than Nagorno Karabakh and Armenia as well. Azerbaijan is richer than Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh because of uh, oil money. Azerbaijan is oil uh, country and you had high prices on oil approximately last 20 years. And Azerbaijan was preparing for that war all this time, buying weapon and finding support uh, outside, etc., etc. But you had escalations. Uh, now the new element of all this was Turkey. Turkey, just two countries supported Azerbaijan in this war against the Gordon Karabakh Armenians, against the Gordon Karabakh Republic. Uh, it was Turkey and Pakistan. But Pakistan supported it just, just by some reasons. Maybe you uh, knew it, <laughs> know it bet, better than me. Turkey and Azerbaijan are Islamic countries. Armenia is Christian country, maybe country populated by uh, Christians. Maybe that was one, one of the reasons. But Turkey supported uh, Azerbaijan directly. In fact, they participated in war. You had uh, Azerbaijani weapon, you had Azerbaijani uh, aircraft, you have planning of operation. It's very, very um, possible that it was planned by, Azer by Turkish generals, etc. So it was war of richer, bigger, 
as Azerbaijan, which is bigger and richer than Armenia, with support of Turkey, uh, with the Gorda Karabakh, which was populated, I said, just with uh, approximately with 150,000 people. Population of Azerbaijan, real population of Azerbaijan is uh, around 7 million people. Population of Turkey is around 80 million of people. So it was technically they were better. Uh, and they had, they were better equipped and planning was very good organized. Uh, maybe the uh, very important factor for this war was that in the United States of America, they are very, very busy with uh, elections and all this Trumpization of all American uh, domestic political life. Europe is, uh, you have post-Brexit problems and all crises in, in Brussels with, with the management of European Union. In NATO, you had problems between NATO itself and Turkey. Turkey is a member of NATO. Uh, it is second army of NATO, but it is very special uh, member of NATO. And their politics is sometimes is very uh, independent from, from Brussels. And Russia is busy with Ukraine crisis, Belarusian crisis, North Stream crisis, and all these problems with the West, which they have in general. And all these actors, uh, they have problems, uh, plus all that, they have problems with Corona and political problems connected with coronavirus and all others in the world had the same. So it was in the center, it was not in the center of, uh, uh, of the interest of uh, world powers. So it was like it was. Azerbaijan. So what you're saying, Alexander, is yeah. that Azerbaijan took the opportunity when the attention of the world was diverted by uh, various issues, including the pandemic, relations with each other. And today on the ground, has uh, Armenia, Armenia, as far as I understand, has lost a substantial amount of the territory that it actually controlled earlier. So today uh, in, Azer in Armenia, what is the mood? Have you reconciled to the fact that this territory is lost and gone back to Azerbaijan? Or is there a mood for uh, revenge? Uh, shortly, I would say that you have both. Uh, yes, territory was lost. And it's not just about territory. Uh, you had 12,000 square kilometers. Now you have about 3,000 square kilometers. Armenian lost Armenians. It's not about Armenia. It's about Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh. They are not citizens of Armenia. They are citizens of Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. But this republic is not recognized by any state in, in the world. As for uh, territories around that, it is not. Uh, just, it, unfortunately, it's not just a uh, war of armies, it's war of populations as well. Uh, territories which are under the control of Azerbaijan, you don't have Armenia in them. As for Armenia itself, it is uh, emotional shock, which was, is very strong. We have a lot of problems in the country. You have, uh, you have people both type, I said you, you have people who said that everything was lost and this territory never will come back and people wouldn't be able to go back to their homes. And you have still people, different political forces and intellectuals and journalists uh, who say that we will, Azerbaijan waited for that moment 26 years. So you can change situation in future, et cetera, et cetera. So now this emotional uh, shock transform, is transforming to political situation. You have political crisis. 
uh, opposition, you have opposition rallies, uh, demonstrations, such kind of uh, things in uh, in Yerevan, in capital of Armenia, against uh, against authorities, against Nikol Pashinyan's government. Uh, you have a kind of united opposition against uh, government. Uh, you have civil society actors, intelligentsia, church, etc., who proclaim their against uh, government. So uh, situation is not very stable. I, I would say that sooner or later uh, it will change somehow. Maybe they will agree to uh, to new elections and to change the government. But now situation is very very. Yeah. Uh, but I have a question before we get into the details of Armenian politics. I have one simple question. Could Russia have intervened earlier? Uh, yes, <laughs> Russia is great power. You know, you, you have, they came in the last moment. They stopped a possibility of real genocide because after Azerbaijanis took some territories, important points, you know, on the mountains, etc., it was a risk for uh, Stepanakir, the capital of the Karabakh Republic, which is a town with approximately about one third of population of all uh, all the Karabakh, and it would be a nightmare. So they came in the last moment. They stopped war. They stopped violence. That's right. But uh, you ask, could they come before? Yes, sure, technically, yes. But what was the problem and what will be the problem, I would say, what is the problem? Turkey. Uh, all I told you about this 26 years, which was situation of uh, no peace, no war situation, from time to time, you had some kind of escalations, shootings and such kind of things. Uh, all these escalations, Russians could stop by telephone call to Baku. Uh, Russia, this is territory which Russians usually call near abroad, the post-Soviet countries. And this territory was territory, which was a territory or still is uh, of Russian special interest because it's just on the borders with Russia. And, we are this post-Soviet world, this is countries which were part of Soviet Union. Now, first time maybe in post-Soviet history, you have Turkey as a player in this region as well. They were here economically. Azerbaijan is connected with Turks, with Turkey. Uh, economically, you have uh, uh, Azerbaijani money in Turkey, you have Turkish money in Azerbaijan, etc. It was before. But now they are here in sense of security. They they are they have military presence here in here, I mean in South Caucasus, in Azerbaijan. But as in northern Syria, uh, Russians uh, will deal with Turks. You have uh, Turks are players as actors uh, in Azerbaijan. And now uh, to do something in, with, with these countries, Azerbaijan and Armenia, Russians will, be, will have need to talk to Turks, to Erdogan, which is something new for this region. In, in sphere, I repeat, it's about sphere of security. But Alexander, tell me, has, yep. has Russia gained from the current situation or has it lost? Uh, I would say Russia was lost. Uh, in Russia, it's very popular to say that we are there physically. We are there with our uh, peacekeepers. So that, that, that means that Russian presence, you have Russian presence on that territory, so that's good for Russia as well. I wouldn't agree fully with that. 
because usually we can see you have Russian forces, for example, in Georgia, in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. I wouldn't say that it is very good for Russia to impact on Georgian politics, vice versa. You have Russians in Ukraine, Russian invention, what Ukraine, uh, from Ukrainian point of view and from point of view of international community, Crimea is Ukraine and Donetsk, Lugansk, uh, it is Ukraine. You have Russian there, but it do does the help uh, Russians to, 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 to have impact on, on uh, Kyiv. You have Russian peacekeepers in Transnistria, Moldova, etc. So I wouldn't say that uh, Russians, uh, you have more Russian impact in Azerbaijan, vice versa. You have a couple of days ago, you had a parade uh, in Baku after the war. Uh, it was on December 10th. And uh, Erdogan was there with Aliyev. Uh, we not, not Putin, not somebody from other country. So uh, I would say that for La Russia lost uh, Azerbaijan uh, and positions of Russians in Azerbaijan are, they have less uh, decreased uh, more than increased. So uh, for Russians, I would say like that, but, but for uh, Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh, it was positive. Finally, they stopped, they stopped the war. Uh, Alexander, so now let us come to something that you, you have been mentioning, and that is Turkey. Turkey is a new player. Uh, Turkey was not physically present in the region. You pointed out that they now are there physically in Azerbaijan. Uh, Turkey is expanding its influence at the expense of Russia. How does this impact Armenia, A, and how is Armenian foreign policy going to uh, uh, sort of address this challenge? Turks and Azerbaijanis are very close ethnically. They have uh, their languages uh, are very close. They're both Muslim nations, etc. And they even uh, have a formula which was produced by, by former president of Azerbaijan, father of nowadays president, Eydar Aliyev, they call it uh, in Turkish, one nation, two states. So this situation is new. So you need to restart, you need to change. How we'll see. Uh, situation, I would say, me personally, I don't think that this situation is very stable because Turkish policy, this is new for our region, but this is not very new for Turkish policy around Turkey. This is the Turkish type, Erdogan's type of, uh, uh, of kind of, I would say, an aggressive policy around them. They are everywhere. They are in, in Iraq, they are in Syria, they are in Libya. You have problem of Turkish-Israeli relationships, Greece, Cyprus, uh, refugees uh, in Europe, etc. So to be troublemaker everywhere, it's a rational policy of Erdogan and, and Turkey feel itself a strong player in the region. They call it neo-Ottomanism. I wouldn't say that Turkey have real resources for such a kind of policy everywhere. So it can change. Uh, it, it, situation is not very stable. For Armenia, it's not very good, sure. And we, we shall see how it's going to change, how uh, the combination of, of uh, forces of actors from outside region will be here. We'll see maybe in several months, it will be more clear. How so are Alexander, they you, yep. you have, uh, I mean, if I may sum up what you said, you, uh, uh, the situation internally in Armenia is not very stable because uh, there is a united opposition, there is united civil society, which feels that the government did not perform well in this crisis. The second is 
you have some kind of loss of influence in the region for Russia, and you have a new player called Turkey that is physically present and is able to exercise some uh, considerable degree of influence on Azerbaijan. Uh, what, because ultimately the peace deal is, I mean, peacekeepers can't stay forever in this territory. There has to be some kind of resolution. So what is your vision of how this problem can be resolved? And what is your vision of uh, how not only can the problem of Nagorno-Karabakh be resolved, but the problems that Armenia is facing internally in a political sense, what do you think is going to be the resolution of that? Uh, I don't think that uh, I will be able to see the resolution of this problem. <laughs> I uh, the problem, you know, uh, you had that agreement, which was signed, uh, signed uh, in November, was not an agreement on peace. It was an agreement of ceasefire. You didn't have a simple word, simple letter about status of Nagorno-Karabakh, about uh, resolution of Nagorno-Karabakh problem. Nagorno-Karabakh problem is still there, especially now after Azerbaijan won the war, they, they don't want really to, to, to go back to the uh, to the peace, trying to uh, negotiations on peaceful solution of the problem. But problem is still there. And now you cannot resolve it by war. You cannot peel, kill, kill, kill just people there because you have Russian peacekeepers. Uh, the shock in Armenia, the euphoria in Azerbaijan will, will continue to live. And uh, only way to try to resolve this problem are negotiations, peaceful solutions, trying to find a formula for resolving of this conflict. I don't think that it is possible now. I don't think that it is possible soon, but the process will go on. Life will continue. We have troubles in Armenia, that's right, but it's not forever. The, the government will change. Uh, you will have elections sooner or later. The, it will be organized to a new type of politics. You have uh, relationships, very positive relationships of Armenia, for example, with France, with Russians, with some countries in Asia. Uh, you have uh, problems of Turks with all their neighbors. It was politics proclaimed by Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Turkey, uh, previous minister, uh, Mr. Dautolo, uh, he called it zero problems with neighbors. Now it became their, uh, zero neighbors without problems. Turkey had problems with all their neighbors. So Armenian question, Armenian uh, politics will be part of all this regional dynamic and we'll see but i'm unfortunately i don't I, I don't think that we can see it in coming years thank you very much alexander iskandrian that was a very insightful uh, conversation we've had i think we've understood some of the complexities but i don't think we will ever understand the full uh, uh, all the issues that are linked with nagorno karabakh uh, but nevertheless, thank you very much, and we hope to see you many times more on the ORF platform. Thank you. Thank you very much as well. Thank you.